Good morning, church, and welcome to the traditional service here in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. I'm Chaplain Castillo, one of the pastors here in this congregation, and today is the fourth Sunday of Lent, meaning we are just three short Sundays away from Easter Sunday, three short Sundays away from Resurrection Sunday, and in a way, for us Christians, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is our Super Bowl, all right? It's my belief it's no bigger day in the Christian calendar. Why do I say that? Because it is the resurrection of Christ that gives us value, gives value to Christmas Day, the birth of Jesus. The resurrection that gives meaning and purpose to his crucifixion. And it is the resurrection that offers us freedom, empowers us to come before the throne of God, amen, individually and collectively to come and worship him with great freedom, amen? Amen. A few quick announcements before we begin. If you didn't know, uh, last week, your offerings to support our brothers and sisters in, in Ukraine were almost $9,000. Awesome. This uh, past Wednesday, we reignited our family night. Great turnout this past Wednesday. You were invited this following Wednesday to join us. Easter sunrise service, 17 April, in the Officers Club, 0630. And on that very day, we have our traditional Easter egg hunt at, at 1030, from 1030 to 1230. And we will begin our small groups ministry in April. More to follow, and there are more announcements in your bulletin. And I received the call to worship. The psalmist says in Psalm 32, verse 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart, for we have come to give glory to our Creator as one body, as one church. We have come to acknowledge our sin before you, O God, in a time of distress and at a time of unsettling in our hearts and in our lives, collectively and individually, whether we realize it or not. We have come to behold a sign. We have come to worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, oh gracious God, receive our songs this morning, receive our prayers this morning, and speak through us, through your chosen vessel, Chaplain Fagney, as we are ready to hear your word. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for this sacred hour. Amen. Please stand for our opening hymn, hymn number 193, Good God is So Good.
indeed you are so good. You are our hiding place. You preserve us from all trouble. It is you who establishes the earth. It is you who we have come to adore. Amen. Please remain standing for him. Number 169, rejoice ye pure in heart. this time take a moment to greet your brother and sister in Christ from the peace of the Lord be with you seated. And now we will proceed with our confession of faith. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. Third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven <clears throat> and seated at the right hand of God. <clears throat> from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Please join me as we confess our sin together, followed by a brief moment of silence for your personal prayers and then the assurance of pardon. 
Pray with me. Loving God, we cannot keep silent. As the psalmist says, our bodies waste away. It groans within us because of your righteous hand that convicts us day and night. And that is a very, very good thing, O Lord. We acknowledge that we cannot carry the weight of your glory, but much less can we bear the burden of our sins. And so we confess our sins to you, O God. We confess that we have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. Forgive us for the things that we do, the things that we don't do that are unbecoming of your children. Cleanse our hearts, cleanse our minds, that we may fully delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Take a moment now to privately confess your sins this week before God. Receive the assurance of pardon. The Apostle Paul declares, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen. Your tithes and offerings support ministries here in Fort Belvoir and around the world. As we're given, now may we give this morning's offerings will now be received. Ushers, we may come forward. Lord, receive our offerings, our tithings, multiply them tenfold for your name's sake. Amen. Stand for the doxology. That was wonderful.
be seated. If you'd like to follow along with me in your pew Bible, we'll be reading on page 462, Psalm 32. Blessed are the forgiven, a mascal of David. Blessed are the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. On page 962, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And on page 874, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. The parable of the prodigal son. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. While his, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, church. We'll recite, we, we, we will recite the Lord's Prayer after the intercessory prayer. So let us bow our heads and go before the throne of the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, let's thank you for this beautiful crisp spring morning and the privilege of being in your house and praying for others. Father God, it saddens our hearts to see the great suffering of your beloved children in the world, to bring to mind all those in our faith community who find themselves needing your healing power, your comfort, and your presence. We especially pray for those who suffer physically with illness or mentally with depression or anxiety or grieving over the loss of a loved one. Father, you know each of them by name, and I pray that you would touch them in a very special way according to their specific needs and your will. Lord, breathe on these people by your Holy Spirit and bring great love, hope, and joy through us, your church. Help us to minister to others in the strength of your Holy Spirit and to work in unity together. Father God, we continue to pray for the divine intervention in Ukraine and for the brave, courageous people just looking for freedom. Father, we pray for those who have been impacted by floods, fires, earthquakes, pandemic viruses, racism, and unnecessary killings, and those arriving from other countries. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our service men and women scattered throughout the world and our first responders who continue to give their lives for our freedom and protection. I pray your hand of protection on those in harm's way. Cover them with your grace and presence and bless their families and loved ones who support them and await their safe return. Father, I pray for your protection over our lives, our families, and other believers. We ask for your hand to cover us and keep us distant from the intent of the evil one and his ways. Send your comfort, your peace, and your calming presence to each and every family and hold them fast to your heart, for it is in God we trust. O oh God, we confess our failure to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We confess that our priorities are not aligned with your thoughts and ways. So we ask you to cleanse our hearts of anything that is not pleasing to you. Forgive us, we pray. And thank you for what you accomplished on the cross for each of us. Father, I pray for our chaplains, our pastor, their ministry and leadership. Give them strength, Father, as they go way beyond their normal duties to shepherd the needs of our Fort Belvoir faith community. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth in your words and prepare our hearts and minds this morning as Chaplain Fickney brings us the message from the Word of God. And Father God, it seems more now, more than ever, that our country needs repentance, healing, and your grace to overcome the hatred, the social unrest, the immorality, 
and the rejection of all religious and moral principles that has plagued our land and our people. Almighty God, I pray for our president and the world leaders. Give them resolve to wage war, not on people, but on poverty, injustice, hunger, disease, and all manner of human suffering. Give them the vision to shape the new world where self-interest is not tempered and correct, but corrected by love and compassion and a hunger for justice. Give to all the world the gift of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, empower us as we worship here and enable us to impact your world for Jesus. Father, we pray that, all, that we will do your work throughout our faith community in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit for your eternal praise and glory. Keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, and you alone for our answers and our healing, for it is in God we trust. We have so many needs, Jesus, but we know all situations are in your hands. Your name is above every name, and your power is great. So we pray and believe in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Father God, all these things we ask in the power and precious name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to say, pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Amen. Let us declare together a thanks for God's grace through hymn number 314. What wondrous love is this. Please stand.
What well, is uh, good to be with you, uh, brothers and sisters, here at uh, our second service for our traditional Protestant congregation. It's blessed at 08 by the grace of God, blessed here at 11 o'clock by the grace of God. And uh, it's good to have Bo and Al and Patrick and others with me twice this morning. It is a good morning. And we continue our movement through the Gospel of John this morning. This morning we're in chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And I just have a uh, simple question. How do you define miracle? If you were to ask Google, if you were to Google miracle, what might Google say back to you? Maybe it would be a miracle if, if Google spoke back to you the definition of miracle. But for today, and today, maybe 10 years ago, we would have thought that outside of the bounds, a little unusual. Today, I guess it's somewhat normal. Sometimes the miraculous just causes us to ask a question, it takes us totally off guard, and we ask the question, did you see that? Have you ever had a did you see that moment? What do those look like? What would it look like if you had a did you see that moment this morning? Here in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, it's a did you see that moment. It is the first miracle, public miracle of the Lord Jesus, and it takes place at a wedding, which is really quite remarkable. Chapters 2 through 11 of the Gospel of John are typically or traditionally known as the Book of Signs, and then we move into the Book of Glory, maybe to chapter 12, it's sort of escaping me at the moment, but here it is. This is the first did you see that moment of Jesus' public ministry. I'm going to read uh, this, uh, this section of scripture, then we're going to move through it. We're going to look at three simple parts. There's a personal request here, there's a provision, and uh, then there is the purpose. All of this uh, really pointing towards the remarkable glory of the sun. Uh, this is the word of God. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Uh, dear woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jar stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial was washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Of the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, help us uh, this morning to see your miraculous working in and through an event recorded in Scripture that took place 2,000 years ago, that we might put our faith in Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Almighty God, may we see your glory and may we reflect your glory, and may that be our great joy forever and ever, I ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so there's a problem here. And there is a personal request for wine. There's a bit of urgency. There's a, a groom. And back in the day, this is not the case today, so I'm a father of four daughters, right? Tina and I, we have four daughters. And it has been our responsibility as parents of our daughters to uh, provide the logistics and to pay for these weddings today. All right? Back in Jesus' time 2,000 years ago, it wasn't the responsibility of the parents of the bride. 
It was the responsibility of the groom. So the groom has a logistical problem. What's the groom's problem? He's out of wine. Have you ever been to a party? Maybe you, you didn't run out of wine, but maybe you ran out of something important, like maybe potato chips. I don't know. <laughs> but you've run out. And there's an issue, right? And you need a resupply. There, there could be a little bit of personal embarrassment here. You know, I've run out of dip. I've run out of guacamole, whatever it might be. Mary identifies the problem. Mary, Jesus' mother. And Mary's never named in the Gospel of John. We see her twice, Jesus' mother, in the Gospel of John. Here at the beginning of his public ministry. And we see him at the end, right? At the cross. And John doesn't name himself in this Gospel. And he doesn't name Jesus' mother, Mary. But there is Mary. And somehow, ever have that person who's sort of embedded and in support of the party? Well, Mary is connected. Perhaps this is a family member, a close family friend. But Mary is, uh, is logistically connected. And she's aware of the problem. And she quietly and she discreetly goes to her firstborn son. Now, Joseph is also not mentioned. And it's likely, tradition has it, that Mary by this point is a widow. And for some time, likely has been dependent on her firstborn son, who's not your normal firstborn son. And Mary knows this, right? She knows uh, who she is speaking and dealing with. But her son nonetheless, and her oldest son, whom would have been responsible in that culture for providing for mom once dad had passed away, Mark calls Jesus not just the carpenter's son, but the carpenter. And so at some point, Joseph has passed. Mary has been dependent on Jesus. And so she goes to him. There's a natural connection. And besides, he's, he's greater than just any normal firstborn son as the firstborn of the heavenly father, the only begotten, the one and only, full of grace and truth. And so Mary, on behalf of the groom, and by the way, it's not just personal embarrassment in this honor culture that's at issue. <laughs> the groom could be sued by the family of the bride for running out of wine. He's on the hook. And by the way, these are parties that ever, anyone ever been to a long wedding? So I've been to some long weddings. You know, I got uh, Macedonians on the side. I've been to some Italian weddings, weddings that have gone on and on into the wee hours of the morning, great celebrations. Tina and I, we had a, an early morning wedding and we had an afternoon reception and it was all over and done with by 1800. So that's the way we rolled. But that's not what was going on in this culture. Weddings lasted anywhere from seven to 14 days. So think about the logistics for that. Seven to 14 days of celebration. And the groom's on the hook. And Mary's connected. She's aware of the need. And so she makes a personal request to her son, Jesus. And what is Je the Jesus response here always sort of gets me. It kills me. He uses a, a word that could almost, almost verge on being almost impolite, but it's like he's, he's kind of giving her, his mom the stiff arm. And he, he uses this word in Greek, gune. And it kind of means, ma'am, what does this have to do with me? Why are you involving me? <laughs> and he ties it in with his hour. My time has not yet come. You can't presume upon me to meet this need. Even though you're my mother, you know, there's no, there's really no, you can't, take advantage of your relationship with me as your firstborn son to meet this need because there's something bigger happening here than just this wedding. Yeah. And so the Lord Jesus sees this a little differently than just a need to run to the commissary or where would you go for wine? Class six, right? He re and, and John, as we go back and we reread this gospel, and this gospel is meant to be reread. Because there are layered meanings here, and Jesus sees something a little differently than Mary. 
Because along with the Messianic age is the concept of new wine that will flow. And Jeremiah talks about it. Amos talks about it. Hosea talks about it. And so there's going to be a connection here with Jesus as the Messiah and this new covenant age flowing with new wine. And he says, my time has not yet come. His hour has not yet arrived. And he'll continue to use that in the Gospel of John as, as we proceed for reasons why he does or does not do things. It'll be uh, his response to his brothers, I think. They're going to the Festival of Lights, and, he say, and, he, and they say, why don't you come with us? And he says, my time has not yet come. His timing isn't quite right. But it's interesting, when the Gentiles ask for him later, I think it's in chapter 12, there's, there's, the, there's a cue. My hour has arrived. And it's the pinnacle of redemptive history, the passion of the Son. And we are approaching his hour as we move through this time of Lent. So for right now, at the beginning of his public ministry, his time has not yet come. He can't reveal his glory. And then uh, Mary, in verse 5, we see the actual provision of new wine as Mary transitions, I think, to a position of faith, and she just says to to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. It's an expression of faith in Christ. Just do whatever he tells you to do. She trusts Jesus with the situation. And close by in verse 6, there are six stone water jars that are pretty large. They hold anywhere from 20 to 30 gallons of water used for ceremonial washing. The old covenant purification. And Christ is about to replace their use. And Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Their usefulness for ceremonial washing is about to come to an end. And he tells them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And the Lord provides new wine. He does it miraculously. I mean, there is a process, right, through which the uh, grapes generate this fermented uh, juice. And it's kind of cool. It may take some time. But we understand it, don't we, chemically? We can explain it scientifically. But there's still something kind of wondrous about it all. But here's something that happens instantaneously. And it's not just diluted you know, it's not just diluted wine. I mean, this was water that chemically changes into wine through just the act of Jesus. And it's not just this raw power that's at place here. But I think there's something really more redemptive and remarkable and only available to some, not to all. But uh, we'll talk about that as we move into the purpose of the new wine. Verses 9 through 11. And so the servants draw this water and they take it to the master of the banquet. And the master of the banquet tastes the water that had been turned into wine. He has no idea where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. And then the master of the banquet calls the bridegroom aside. And instead of the bridegroom being ashamed and embarrassed... What are you doing serving water? What happened? <laughs> he is honored. And uh, the master of the banquet says, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had just a little bit too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. And rather than being covered in shame, this bridegroom is honored and glorified. And the master of the banquet has no idea. I don't think the groom has a clue. What do you think the groom said? (laughs) So what is the purpose of this miracle? Well, some have said that the purpose of this uh, this in Cana is uh, is that Jesus is sort of giving a stamp of certification onto weddings. It It was something that Adam... 
and Eve experienced promise there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, established there in the creation covenant. So, yeah, we see that. There is uh, this remarkable provision of something in a totally unexpected way. And it is miraculous. Water doesn't just instantaneously turn into wine. So I, I just, what's the purpose of this miracle? Maybe I, let me ask this question. What's the purpose of miracles in general? And can we actually get a, a solid definition of, of miracle? Because that'll even shift. You know, I think if you were to Google miracle, it would talk about, you know, a, an act that is extraordinary that goes beyond our ability to explain with our current knowledge of nature or science. It might be attributed to, to, uh, to God or to a divine source, a miracle. And we often hear about it, you know, in, uh, in categories that uh, are sort of um, contained in a box or that which might be contrary to natural law or physical law, whatever it might be. I think that there is, uh, for, for myself, I think the miraculous is maybe a little simpler or by the time I finish explaining it to you, it may make no sense at all, so therefore entirely <laughs> confused. But here's my, my simple take on this concept of miracle. It's, it's not that God acts in a way that is different than our scientific understanding of the world or what probabilities might point towards. I think it's God acting in a way that's different than our expectations in regards to his justice. Contrary to his law, not our law or what we think law should be of the universe, but rather I think it's God acting in a way that may be a little different than how we think his law kind of works. So go back to the garden and uh, Adam and Eve are established there uh, they've been given to one another in marriage, and they are one. And then in chapter 3, uh, there is this covenant, well, there's a covenant warning given to them. There's covenant blessing is promised as they, uh, they work the garden, as they fulfill uh, God's requirements for them. I really think that the first Adam could have earned what the second Adam earned, which is heaven itself, through his faithfulness. But he doesn't, does he? The first Adam fails miserably, and he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what was God's promise? What was the law established there in, uh, at the beginning of creation? If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely what? Perish. Perish you will surely die. That's the promise. If you disobey me, then covenant punishment falls on you in the form of death. There is, uh, there's justice. That's just pure justice. And so now God, who is obligated to keep his word and act in a way that is totally consistent with who he is, arrives in the garden after Adam and Eve take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat of that fruit. And now they have fallen. And they're aware of their guilt. And when God comes into the garden, instead of greeting him as their heavenly father, they run from him because of their shame and their guilt. And they are fearful. And they're fearful of judgment. They know God. Now what does God do? He provides a substitute. He provides a substitute ultimately in the person of his son, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. He is the uh, fulfillment of the promise there in the garden in Genesis 3.16, that uh, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent while merely bruising his heel. And there is a substitutionary atonement that they are called to put their faith in, that there must be one who pays the penalty for this transgression. And there is a sacrifice in the garden to cover their guilt and to clothe them of their nakedness. So what was expected was God's justice and his righteousness. You know what the surprising thing is, brothers and sisters? 
know what the really, did you see that moment is in redemptive history? It said Adam didn't pay the penalty for his sin on the spot in the garden. It was miraculous that God didn't just judge all of humanity right there in that moment and end human history. We have an expectation of the breath of life and we presume upon the grace of God every day. And we just, the question we are typically asking is, why do good people suffer? And the radical truth, brothers and sisters, is that since the fall, there's no one good. It's miraculous that any of us have the breath of life today. And so providence, the sustaining of creation, is really established through the miraculous work of God in his grace. It's his mercy that intersects his justice on the cross of Calvary. Satisfying the requirements of the law because the guilty must be punished. And so the son becomes the guilt offering, right? God, God's self, who knew no sin became sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. That's the miracle, that God provides a substitute. He satisfies his justice with his one and only son and demonstrates love that is remarkable. Did Jesus need to step into the gap here at this wedding? Wouldn't you love to have Jesus at your party? I would. <laughs> Was there any obligation of him, the carpenter, to do anything? He could have just sat back and watch everything just sort of unfold as there was no new provision of wine. There's no running to the commissary for the wine. And the groom could have been chastised by the master of the banquet, right? And, and, and put to shame. And he could have possibly been sued. But Jesus mercifully provides miraculously this new wine. And it's a picture, isn't it, of this new covenant age that day when he will come and that he as this heavenly, beautiful, spotless bridegroom will marry his bride, the church. And once a month, I think we should do it more often. What's the cool thing about being deployed? Okay, if there's one cool thing about being deployed, is everything I ex every time I executed a, a worship service, whether it was two, three, five, fifty, whatever, you could have the Lord's Supper and get a little foretaste of that new covenant wine. Jesus provides a little glimpse here of this new covenant wine that will flow forever and ever. No obligation to do this. He miraculously provides himself as the fulfillment of covenant promise. Now, who saw this miracle? Who had the did you see that moment? The groom probably, but he had no idea, I don't think. He may have found out later, but he sure was shocked that he was receiving the praise that he was receiving. Maybe he was unaware that he ran out of wine. Did the master of the banquet have any idea of the glory of God revealed here? He had no idea. How about the people who were drinking the wine that was provided for by the Lord? Did they know? Did they have a clue? They had no idea, and yet they were benefiting from it. They were enjoying this new wine. The servants, did they understand and know what happened? There was a, they, they knew that they poured water into those, into those uh, large containers, right? And they knew that when they pulled it out, something miraculous had happened. This, they couldn't explain this, that this was new wine. I wonder, I wonder if they saw it change in the cup. I wonder if it was already changed in the container. And now they're, t they're carrying this new wine to the master of the banquet. Jesus' disciples saw this first of his miraculous signs in verse 11. He reveals his glory. And I think it's a wonderful word that uh, John uses in verse 11, RK, which takes us back to the beginning, the first in the beginning. Verse 1 of chapter 1, he reveals his glory. And what's the purpose? It's the purpose of this entire book. So that we might, have, like little children, 
put our faith in Jesus Christ. That we might put our faith in him. So who are we? So let me say this, brothers and sisters. The purpose of God's miracles always is to glorify his name. And he glorifies his name in each and every individual within this narrative. But it's a little different. Think about miracles, marvelous deeds, wondrous acts in redemptive history in the Old Testament with the Israelites in Egypt. Think about the effect of those miracles on the Egyptians. Think about the effect of those miracles on Pharaoh's heart. It didn't necessarily lead to putting faith in the Lord. His heart was hardened. And that is mysterious. All of us will encounter the miraculous power of God. But we will not always see God's glory in those things. What turns it from curse to blessing, from punishment to really new life, is the gift of faith, eyes to see, the glory of God. Really, every breath that we draw is miraculous. We are undeserving of it all. We're all that bridegroom. We're all sons of the first Adam. But it's an amazing thing that God in his goodness has placed us in the hands of his son, and given us eyes to see, like Mary and like the disciples. And if you're not certain, brothers and sisters, then I just ask that you would just ask God for the eyes to see his glory and his miraculous acts. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you can see it in his creation, his beauty and his glory, and you can see it here in worship. And it's been good to have a little foretaste of heaven with you this morning. I'm beginning to talk about this hour when we gather together to worship him as the most dangerous hour on Fort Belvoir because we are encountering the living God together. And, he can, and it moves through, all right, he's with us 24-7, but there is something good about gathering together and hearing his gospel preached and proclaiming the praises of his name with one another. We are commanded to do it, and it's a miraculous thing that we can do it and it's a good thing. And so may God enable us to taste the new wine and see the glory of his son together. And may it be for blessing and not the hardening of our hearts. So question, brothers and sisters, did you see that? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and for your mercy and your goodness to us in providing it and enabling us to see a miracle 2,000 years removed as we read about it, as John testified to it by your son in a very real situation, in a very real event with a family wedding in Cana of Galilee. Help us, Almighty God, to see your grace and your glory, to put our trust in you. Forgive us for our hearts that are hard. They are hard. I ask that you would soften them, that you would breathe life into them that you do the most miraculous thing imaginable, that you would take us as dead in sin, and that you would make us spiritually alive in Christ our Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, hymn number 443, Ozion, Haste. God.
receive the benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead Christ Jesus, the great shepherd, equip you to do all good works that is pleasing to him, to Christ Jesus our Lord, to whom belongs all the glory, all the power, all the honor forever and ever. Amen. This concludes our service. Go forth with courage and serve your Lord.